Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Institute for Australian and Chinese Arts and Culture at Western Sydney University. My name is Jing Han, I'm the director of this institute. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge that this institute is on the Parramatta campus, Parramatta South campus, which is on the country of the Darug people of the Darug nation, and acknowledge their ancestors who have been the traditional owners of their country for tens and thousands of years. We also want to pay our respect to the First Nations elders, past, present, and emerging. Chinese Australian history is truly rich and diverse. So far, our series since 2020 have, have covered a range of topics, and there are still more to talk about. Today's lecture is on another very interesting topic, anti-opium legislation and Aboriginal protection in the Chinese Australian newspapers from 1894 to 19, 1900 by Dr. Dr. Xu. Dr. Xu is a currently a research fellow at Macquarie University. She completed her PhD at the University of Hong Kong where she is an adjunct assistant professor. Her research interests include post-colonial studies, cultural theory, indigenous literature, Asian Australian literature, children's literature, race and, and ethnicity, settler uh, colo colonial, colonialism, settler colonialism. Her book, Indigenous Culture Capital, Post-Colonial Narratives in Australian Children's Literature won the Australian, Cons Australian China Council's Biennial Australian Studies in China Book Prize in 2018. She has published in various journals, including Interventions International Journal of the Post-Colonial Studies, Journal of Post-Colonial Writing, Australian Historical Studies, Journal of Australian Studies. Australian Aboriginal Studies, et cetera. She received the Australian Historical Association's Alan Martin Award 2022. Her current research uses literary, cultural, and historical studies approaches to examine the cross-cultural engagements between Indigenous Australians and Asian migrants, particularly the relationships between Indigenous and Chinese peoples. In this talk, she will share part of her research fundings. As previously, we will take questions from the audience at the end of the lecture. So please post your questions at the Q&A function and I will collect them at the end of the uh, lecture. So now please welcome Dr. Do Zhu to give us the lecture. Thanks, Professor Han. Thanks everyone for coming. Please let me share my screen with you. First of all, I acknowledge the Dara people as the traditional custodians of the land upon which Macquarie University is built. I pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to acknowledge the land where I live is the traditional and unceded territories of the First Nations in Canada. Today's a popular lecture. Um, I will kindly remind our audience that there may be culturally sensitive terms which reflect the terms when they were used and has may be considered inappropriate today. They do not reflect the opinions of the speaker. The Aboriginals Protection and Restriction of the Sale of Opium Act 1897 came into effect, um, excuse me, yeah, work, sorry, technical issues. The Aboriginals Protection and Restriction of the Sale of Opium Act 1897 came into effect in Queensland allegedly to prohibit the supply of opium to Aboriginal people. The act has been recognized as one of the most stringent policies imposed upon Aboriginal communities. As Helen Reynolds points out, 
it was far more restrictive than any contemporary legislation operating in New South Wales or Victoria and implemented a system of tight controls and closed reserves. It allowed appointed Aboriginal protectors as a means of legally sanctioned state paternalism to remove Aboriginal people to designated reserves, to grant permits for employing Aboriginal people, to prohibit entry of non-Aboriginal people into the reserves, and to institutionalize any Aboriginal or half Aboriginal children. There is a rich body of literature on this law examining its impact upon Aboriginal people. The latest item is Fiona Body's Bite in the Clouds, which examines from budget perspective, the restrictions and displacement of opium addicted Aboriginal people on Fraser Island enforced by the 1897 Act. Here, why do I want to talk about the 1897 Act in the Chinese Australian History Seminar? The reasons are manifold. First, any opium policies linked Aboriginal people and Chinese migrants together for the first time in the history of Australian legislation. The 1897 Act in Queensland in particular tied the restrictions of Aboriginal people with anti-Chinese sentiment. Under this Act, any person who supplied opium to an Aboriginal person for non-medicinal consumption was guilty of an offence. There was no provision specifically against the Chinese. Nevertheless, shortly after the Act's implementation, the first conviction was obtained in which a Chinese doorkeeper called Yang King at Winton was fined 50 pounds for selling opium to an Aboriginal woman. I would like to say a few more words about this case. In fact, Yang King had been found guilty under the 1891 Act. There were a number of convictions of Chinese people who had been charged with supplying Aborigines with opium since the enactment of the Sale and Use of Poisons Act 1891, which I will talk about later. Convictions of Chinese for selling opium to Aborigines between 1892 and 1897 can be found in the newspapers such as the Queenslander and the Western Champion and General Advertiser for the Central Western Districts. The number and frequency of these convictions varied in different places. Some noted several convictions and substantial fines. Others believed there have been numerous convictions of Chinese doorkeepers charged with selling the drug. Second, there is little scholarship exploring the agency of the Chinese community in the control of opium and their responses to anti-opium legislation, as well as their perspectives on the practices of Aboriginal protection invoked in the legislation's title. Let me continue with Yang King's case. The news of Yang King's conviction was conveyed to Anglophone colonialists by several local newspapers, including the Brisbane Courier, Queenslander, and others. This newspaper showed little interest in the Chinese responses to the charges of selling opium to Aborigines. Chinese voices, more often than not, were silent or misrepresented. On a different case, a news report published by the Australian Town and Country Journal on November the 2nd, 1895, had a rare or bit cursory line. Some of the Chinamen who had been made to pay the penalty of the demoralizing offense of opium selling loudly protest their innocence and aver that they had been cruelly entrapped and wrongly condemned. So how did the Chinese respond to settler colonialism, uh, to settle colonial governance? in relation to the anti-opium legislation? How did Chinese migrants view Aboriginal dispossession and protection under British colonization? This talk aims to address these questions through an examination of the Chinese Australian newspapers, which reveal much about Chinese Australians saw the relations between opium, Aborigines and themselves in the 1890s. The third reason, which is the most important reason for examining this 1897 Act from a Chinese perspective, is to dispel any assumption that Chinese migrants were indifferent to or ignorant of Aboriginal affairs. 
As a matter of fact, the 19th century Chinese Australian newspapers, the Chinese Australian Herald and the Dongwa News, which I will talk about in the next slide, commented at length on issues concerning Aboriginal people and their relations with the Chinese. Much of this coverage pertained to anti-opium legislation, which brought Chinese Aboriginal relationships to the fore. Australia's early national newspapers in Chinese language, which emerged in the mid to late 1890s, played a significant role in publishing and shaping Chinese voices on anti-opium legislation. These newspapers include the Chinese Australian Herald, which published the first weekly issue on September 1st, 1894, and Don Wat News, launched in 1898 and published twice a week. The Chinese Australian Herald was owned by George Arthur Zhang, James Alexander Phillip, and Sun Junchen, also known as Sun Johnson. Li Tai Zhang and Sun Johnson were the editors. The Zhonghua News was jointly founded by the Chinese merchants, including businessman John Thomas E. Hing and other smaller market gardeners. Both newspapers were based in Sydney and had a national circulation. In this presentation, uh, the extracts of news reports were from the Chinese Australian Herald. So I will only focus on uh, what is reporting in the Chinese Australian Herald. So in today's presentation, I will first briefly review the discriminatory legislation on opium control, as well as the symbolic association between opium, Chinese men and Aboriginal female sexuality during the late 19th century. Then I will use early Chinese language newspapers to delineate a distinctly Chinese approach to settle colonial governance, including opium control and the protection of the Aboriginal population prior to federation. The opium question. Humans have an extensive history of using opium for therapeutic and other purposes, despite the recognized danger of excessive consumption and addiction. But not until the 19th century was the use of opium as a narcotic substance regulated in Western societies. I will talk about the use and control of opium in China in the next section. In Australia, within flux of Chinese migrants during the gold rush in the 1850s and 60s, opium smoking among Chinese migrants became a public concern. Towards the 19th Towards the 1800s, sorry, towards the 1890s, opium smoking grew more prevalent among Chinese migrants. Apart from a small proportion of opium used for medicinal purposes, nearly 95% of the imported opium was sold to and consumed by the Chinese community. In 1891, approximately two pounds of opium per head was consumed in New South Wales and Victoria, and the opium used per capita had further increased by 1902. But as Desmond Mendelssohn points out, mainstream European society at that time was less concerned about the effects of opium on health than opium as a symbol of the Chinese, of fears of invasion, of sexual license, of racial impurity, of pollution and violation. It was within this context that opium regulation and prohibition was conceived. In fact, opium had been officially characterized as poisonous before being the subject of specific legislation. In 1862, South Australia passed the first statute in Australia called an act to regulate the sale of certain poisons, 1862, to regulate the sale and use of poisons by establishing poisons book. Although the book itself did not include opium, the act did requiring opium and other substances to be labeled as poison. Other states followed suit by passing similar poisons acts between the 1870s and 1890s. Queensland passed the Sale and Use of Poisons Act, 1891, which I mentioned earlier in Young King's case. This act included opium and its preparations in the poisons book. It marked the beginning of anti-opium legislation in Australia. The 1891 Act aimed to address the mounting concern about the consumption of opium, but in effect, 
targeted Aboriginal and Chinese people only. It prohibited the supply of opium to any Aboriginal person, save for medicinal purposes. While the Chinese allegedly used opium to exchange with Aboriginal people for work and sexual favors, so did white pastoralists and commercial salesmen. However, the 1891 Act was racially discriminatory, stipulating that a certificate for a dealer in poison shall not be granted to any person of the Asiatic race, a clause added during the parliamentary debate of this bill. The debate made the point explicitly that it was the only Chinese they aimed at. Following the Sale and Use of Poisons Act 1891, the Opium Act 1895 was introduced in South Australia. This was recognized as the first legislation in English speaking countries dedicated solely to the prohibition of opium use and sale for non medicinal purposes. It attempted to resolve the opium question in the Northern Territory, which was then administered as part of South Australia. Northern Territory was a region with only a small population of white settlers, a large Aboriginal population, and a significant number of Chinese migrants. South Australia's Opium Act 1895 made it an offense to sell, barter, exchange, or give, or permit to be sold, bartered, exchanged, or given any opium to any Aboriginal native of Australia or half caste of that race, other than as a medicine. However, this act, similar to Queensland's Sale and Use of Poisons Act 1891, ultimately proved to be far from effective. Towards the end of the 19th century, it was widely believed that Aboriginal people were at risk of dying off. The Aboriginal population in Queensland decreased rapidly from more than 200,000, estimated in 1840, to fewer than 25,000 in 1901. In 1894, Archibald Meston was commissioned to investigate the situation of Aboriginal people in North Queensland. Meston reported that opium had taken the toll on Aboriginal lives in schools in various parts of Queensland by the mid 1890s. He wrote, the great effect of opium apparently takes complete possession of the Aboriginal leading to the paralysis of mental and physical faculties, the total destruction of energy and willpower, and the annihilation of all sense of manhood or womanhood, self-respect, shame, virtue, honesty, and veracity. In this report, Master noted that it was the Chinese who introduced opium to Aboriginal people at first, but later many Europeans used it as the only agent to induce Aboriginal men to work and to keep Aboriginal women around the station. But Meston was careful in discerning the role of the Chinese in the sale of opium, who were not the only criminals in this business, but the scapegoats to carry the more prominent scenes of the degrading traffic. Bringing together the purposes of Aboriginal protection and regulation of opium use, Queensland enacted the Aboriginal Protection and Restriction of the Sale of Opium Act. 1897, including many of Weston's recommendations. The 1897 Act not only maintained the sale of opium to Aboriginal people for non-medicinal purposes as an offense, it also outlawed possession and delivery of opium except by authorized sellers, such as medicinal practitioners, chemists and wholesale dealers issued with a permit. Due to the severity of punishment and the scale of law enforcement, the 1897 Act exerted significant impact upon the Chinese community. And so its enforcement received considerable, co considerable coverage in the Chinese language newspapers. There is an extended history of opium consumption and control in China. The world's first edict that prohibited the sale of opium and managing the opium houses was enacted in 1729 during the reign of the Yongzheng Emperor of the Qing Dynasty. In 1839, the destruction of opium ceased from British 
traders and women led to the outbreak of the First Opium War, also known as the First Sino-British War, during 1839 to 1842, marking the beginning of modern Chinese history. The harmful effect of opium was recognized by the Chinese community in Australia. Because opium smoking was pervasive in China's camps and rendered many Chinese destitute, particularly among the lower classes, and the opium initiatives were widely supported. Towards the final decades of the 19th century, many Chinese, especially community leaders and elites, such as Mei Kuang Tat, pled for the end of opium smoking and petitioned the authorities to stop importing opium. The Chinese language newspapers, the Chinese Australian Herald, and the Dongwan News offer insights into Australian anti-opium legislation from primarily Chinese perspectives through news reports, feature stories, editorials, commentaries, and readers' letters. They publish news from a wide variety of sources and regions across Australia, representing views from across social and class stratifications among the Chinese migrants. They compiled and translated government announcements, policies, and reports from English language newspapers. Chinese editors and journalists, well, their names seldom appear alongside the news articles, which was unfortunate. Um, express, they expressed not only the desire to challenge injustice against the Chinese due to opium control measures, but also convey the aspiration to engage in wider public affairs and governance. Here comes to the fun part. One of the earliest news reporting, uh, one of the earliest news reports in the Chinese Australian Herald on Queensland's 1897 Act entitled New Rules on the Opium Control provided Chinese translation of selected provisions of the Act and questioned whether the Act was effective in achieving its stated goal. It sharply pointed out the incongruity between restricting the sale of opium within the colony while not forbidding importation of opium. The government obtained double revenue, taxation of opium imports, and fines for selling the imported opium. The newspaper denounced the act as characteristic of harsh governance. Here, I would like to give you an example of the Chinese Australian Herald's critical coverage of a law enforcement incident related to this act. It was a feature article entitled Harsh Ban Disturbs People, published on February the 25th, 1898. Well, the article unraveled a court case in which a Chinese gardener referred to as Y was caught by two white constables, K and W, for having supplied opium to an Aboriginal man, D. Constable K served as the prosecutor of this case. Well, initial, um, sorry, initiatives are used here um, because the original article only provides the Chinese translation of the English names, and it is difficult to ascertain their um, names in English. Well, D told the magistrate that he worked as an Aboriginal tracker, and he went to White's house to buy one ounce of opium, accompanied by the two constables. The magistrate questioned D whether he was in uniform on the day of the incident. D denied he was. See this. According to the 1897 Act stipulated, anyone guilty of an offence should be liable to a penalty including fines, one half of which shall be paid to the person given the information which leads to such conviction. It was not unusual that the police used Aboriginal trackers in plain clothes to detect offenders of unlawful opium trades, and the Aboriginal trackers were rewarded some payment out of the fine if the suspect was convicted. Back to the court case. 
It was why, then it was wise turn to swear the oath before the court and defend himself. There was a noteworthy detail. It was the colonial legal custom that one was required to take an oath on a Christian Bible. Non-Christian Chinese could blow out a match as an alternative, which was recognized formally as equivalent to the oath. However, Wai chose to follow the Western custom of kissing the Bible, suggestive of his willingness to conform to colonial convention in expectation of justice in court. Here is Wai's defense, which unfolds more twists in terms of the alleged incident. D actually twice came to buy opium from Wai. At first, Wai rejected D and called him and told him that it was forbidden to sell opium to Aboriginal people. After D left, constables K and W came to Wai's place and asked if Wai saw an Aboriginal man just now. Yes, Wai replied. He wanted to buy some opium. W then said, we're looking for an Aboriginal thief. If he comes to your place again, could you please keep him with some food and opium? Wai refused because it was unlawful. W insisted, we're constables. Give him some opium. Give him fine because it's different from selling. The next day, D came to buy food and opium again. Wai followed W's request to give D some opium. But soon, Y was apprehended. After two days' trial, Y was found guilty and penalized with a fine in exchange for a month's imprisonment. His penalty also included confiscation of one pound of opium. This case presented a counter narrative of Chinese convictions for selling opium. It interweaves a self interested sting orchestrated by the police, plotting against a Chinese man collusion between two white constables, one serving as the prosecutor and an Aboriginal tracker, and the acquiescence of the magistrate. The melodrama of this story, on the, other, on the one hand, lays bare anti-Chinese sentiment and injustice under the anti-opium legislation. On the other, the law-abiding Chinese why unsettled the stereotypes of the wicked, corrupted, immoral Chinese associated with the symbolic evil of traffic in opium. What most deserves our attention about this feature story is that the newspaper criticized the enforcement of the 1897 Act for causing disturbance to the community. The text began by explicating the interlocking relationships between law enforcement, people's well-being, and the governance of a nation state. It says, whenever a government is formed, it is imperative to politicize and educate the people by the rule of law. The implementation of good law benefits people and brings harmony and peace. Benevolent rule is thereby achieved and can be extolled. The implementation of a bad law creates a hotbed for the ills of society. As a result, people are annoyed, they suffer, and such despotic rule can hardly be sustained. It expressed disapproval of the newly enacted Anti-Opium Act in Queensland before delving into the detail of Wise court case. This style of writing was typical in feature stories, commentaries, and editorials of the Chinese Australian Herod which not only highlighted the central ideas of the article, but also served to educate its readers by drawing on Chinese classics and doctrines pertinent to politics, philosophy, and morality. Here, the text evaluated the, le the legislation of opium control from the perspective of state governance. It acknowledged the benefit of opium control in increasing government revenue and improving people's well-being. Yet through Wise case, it railed against hasty implementation of this forceful restriction, arguing strongly that the act left solely the time for opium smokers to quit their habit and vendors to clear stocks that the ink is still not yet dry. This was not a straightforward outcry against perceived racial bias, nor was it pro-opium to defend the interest of Chinese sellers. Instead, 
It ascribed the grievances aired by the Chinese community to impetuous legislative decisions and lack of statecraft. It envisioned more orderly times and suggested progressive measures the state should adopt in, act, in enacting new laws. First, publicize the law, for example, through newspapers. Second, allow time to admonish the people, including vendors and residents, against opium smoking and selling. Third, the police detect offenders, the police detect offenses and treat first-time offenders with leniency. And lastly, impose he heavy penalties on repeat offenders, as the newspaper said. The author elevated injustice against the Chinese to a matter of state governance and engaged with perspectives of nation building as a stakeholder. This is significant. Both the perspectives on statecraft ventured in this newspaper challenged the presumption of Chinese migrants as sojourners rather than as established and interested settlers. Unfortunately, these constructive opinions were dismissed by the colonial authorities and partly due to the language barrier, Chinese voices were barely heard, if at all, by the dominant European society. Wise case was not exceptional, for the Chinese Australian Herald reviewed a dozen other incidents in which innocent Chinese men wrongly charged under the 1897 Act. Here is another example. The report appeared, this report appeared in the um, in the Chinese Australian Herald on March the 11th, 1898, entitled Arresting the Innocent. A Chinese fisherman called Ling Li was arrested for selling opium. However, the policeman, Mr. Ling Li for Ya Tian, was the target suspect. Even though Ling Li is explained that he was not Ya Tian, who was held in custody for two nights, and whose clan members filed a complaint, asking the police to search for Ya Tian so that Ling Li's innocence could be established. Ya Tian was caught before long. Nevertheless, the policeman was not concerned with who was who and colluded with an Aboriginal person to accuse Ling Li of illegally selling opium. The magistrate first considered the penalty of 100 pound. But knowing that the police had arrested the wrong person, the magistrate imposed a reduced penalty of 10 pound, together with court expenses on Ling Li. Faced with the court's decision, Ling Li's lawyer turned to the clan members saying that his brother was a barrister and one of his relatives was a judge in Brisbane. He advised Ling Li to borrow 10 pound from his clan members in order to in order to conclude this case, and then to sue the policeman for wrongly arresting him, because the conclusive evidence suggested there was a high chance of winning the case. After learning the plan of Ling Li's lawyer, the policeman became concerned about the consequences of a, law of a lawsuit and offered to appease Ling Li by repaying him 10 pound. This case unsettles the assumption that the Chinese as wicked perpetrators or helpless victims, and illustrates how the Chinese navigated a racially biased legal system while managing to deploy the law in defense of justice. The 1897 Act had a two-pronged target, control of opium and Aboriginal protection. Although Chinese editors and journalists severely criticized the 1897 Act. They recognized that the Act was motivated by concern that the consumption of opium would decimate the already dwindling Aboriginal population. As well, it was not uncommon for Chinese editors and journalists to express sympathy towards Aboriginal people for being dispossessed of their traditional land. In the commentary entitled Peter Black People, the author remarked, New Gold Mountain was in fact the property of Aboriginal people inherited from their ancestors. However, the British came and raised the flag near Botany Bay and claimed the possession of this land. Chinese editors and journalists presented to their reader, 
readers that Aboriginal people had owned ancestral land and territory of sea prior to European settlement. For example, the Chinese Australian Herald News on February the 25th, 1898, reported on the case on Thursday Island in which a Chinese skipper named Zhou Bao was convicted for employing indigenous people on board without permission being granted under the provisions of the 1897 Act and fined close to a hundred pound. The report argued that Thursday Island, the land and the adjacent waters had always been owned by black people. The British occupied this place and stripped the rights of the black people. The reporter believed that the charge against the Chinese for employing Aborigines arose from jealousy among the British settlers. Aboriginal dispossession of the traditional land was neither secret nor a taboo topic in 19th century Chinese Australian newspapers. The robust discussions, as I will argue, were deeply associated with concerns facing the Chinese migrants particularly the concerns about the precarious political situation back in China under the threat of Western powers. By engaging with the settler colonial governance of Aboriginal affairs, these editors and journalists articulated a distinctly Chinese voice to resistance, um, Chinese voice of resistance to Western imperialism and colonial dominance. At this point, it's necessary to address uh, protection as a contested imperial concept. Central to the policies of opium control was the ostensible endeavor, Aboriginal protection, through which the British exerted control over Aboriginal lives. The meaning protection has been highly contested. By situating protection within a wider global history, Lauren Benton and Adam Carlow observed fluid politics of protection that absorbed both the powerful and the weak while giving rise to institutions and jurisdictional arrangements with broad geographical scope and influence. For the 19th century Chinese migrants, protection was nothing new. Throughout China's imperial history, the notion of protection was rooted in the philosophy of state governance in dealing with the relationship between the government and its governed people. Protective arrangements also manifested in the extensive tributary system between China, also known as the Middle Kingdom at that time, and its neighboring countries. When Chinese Australian newspapers commented on protection in Aboriginal affairs, they drew on Chinese views on the promise and practice of protection. From this background, Chinese editors and journalists express their understanding of settler colonial governance and colonized Aboriginal sus um, subjects. Here are some examples. A news report, Aboriginal Protection, published by the Chinese Australian Herald on November 30th, 1894, reported the, mean, reported the meeting of Aborigines Protection Board in New South Wales. The attendants were all in court that the expenses of sending missionaries to Aboriginal communities and their salaries should be paid by the Aboriginal people. The reporter described the approach as fair. This news offered a glimpse into the imperial practice of protection, commonly understood by the Chinese at that time, in which extracting tributes from the protected party was deemed reasonable. On July the 22nd, 1898, the newspaper published a commentary under the same title, Aboriginal Protection, which illustrated Chinese philosophical thoughts on the protected relations formed between the state and its subjects. The article first mentioned a meeting of the Aborigines Protection Board, which discussed the government's proposal to remove Aboriginal camps away from the river bank to the reserves so as to segregate them from white settlement. The commentary concluded with the government proposals, reasoning that Aboriginal camps were prone to fire hazards and were not aesthetically pleasing. While the reserves were equipped with corrugated iron shelters, rations, medicines, and doctors. 
The commentary judged the authorities appropriately paternalistic. Their concern akin to the concern that adults show for children and that Aborigines were legitimate recipients of that concern. The author suggested that Aboriginal people in return should love the authorities as parents. The appeal to a father-son relationship between the authorities and Aboriginal people was rooted in traditional Chinese thoughts on statecraft, which endorsed the parental role of the state vis-a-vis -vis individual subjects. While many would nowadays judge the didactic tone of the suggestion on Aboriginal governance inappropriate, the item illustrates Chinese community engagement in public and racial affairs. While generally supportive of settler colonial initiatives to ameliorate the impact of the colonization and dispossession of Aboriginal people, when the Chinese Australian Herald compared British protection in Australia with British and Russian diplomacy towards China, it revealed a drastically different attitude. The Chinese Australian Herald editorial on May the, 20, on May the 19th, 1899, titled Collusion Out of Self-Interest, argued that Britain and Russia had signed a treaty to protect their own interests in China. At that time, imperial powers, primarily Britain, Russia, Germany, France, and Japan, were competing for the territorial dismemberment of China. Russia took control of northern China and Britain gripped the region of the Yangtze River, where they held a range of privileges, such as the building and owning of railways, profiting from coal mines and control of customs. The treaty between Britain and Russia was intended to ensure the interests would not clash, and to thwart Germany, which had been coveting their territories in China. The seventh clause of the treaty as this editorial noted, claimed that both parties, Britain and Russia, shall protect China from foreign incursions. The editorial compared the clause of China protection with the practice of Aboriginal protection in Australia. With the sarcasm, it pointed out that the British sought to protect Aboriginal people through institutions such as the Aborigines Protection Board. But it was the British who dispossessed Aboriginal people of their traditional land. Citing incidents in which white men who shot Aboriginal persons dead were not charged with murder in Queensland, the editorial asked a forceful rhetorical question, what on earth is Aboriginal protection? That is lip service. By drawing the analogy between China and Aboriginal Australia under imperial dominance, the editorial exposed the empty rhetoric of protection, suggesting that imperial colonizers were replicating practices of protection only in order to extend their colonial power and influence. Later in 1899, the Chinese Australian Herald returned to the subject of Aboriginal protection in a lengthy editorial entitled Pity Black People expressing resentment and resistance to British colonization. The editorial began by reporting the meeting of the Aborigines Protection Board, the past notions to provide food, seed potatoes, and necessary assistance for Aboriginal people in New South Wales. It then acerbically asserted that these actions, although well-intentioned, were ghastly in nature. It argued that the British dispossessed Aboriginal people of their land and treated them with injustice. A white man kills an Aboriginal person as if he kills an insect or an ant or simply pulls up weeds. But if a white man is killed, the Aboriginal suspect must be executed. The editorial stressed that racial injustice accounted for the diminishing of the Aboriginal population. The analysis further just opposed the British futile protection of Aborigines in Australia with how they colonized India, encroached Hong Kong, used up coal mines in Shandong province of China, and for the Boer War in South Africa. By situating the British protection of Aboriginal people within a transnational context, in particular linking Aboriginal Australia with China, 
this editorial not only laid bare the hypocrisy and ruthlessness of British protectors, but warned of the consequences of colonization for China and their fellow countrymen. So quickly to sum up, this presentation has just opposed different discourses evolving around the anti-opium legislation. By examining the Chinese language newspapers, it offered a glimpse into the Chinese views of settler colonial governance, including the legal control of, control of opium and the protection of Aboriginal population in the final years of the 19th century. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Dodge. It is incredible and it's so interesting. And especially looking back, I mean, with the current, the, the queen has just passed away and, and there are so many, uh, I mean, there are the other side of the voices uh, discussing a lot about British colonization. And it's incredible to see back in 1890s and even earlier, Chinese newspapers in Australia, they expressed their views, it's incredible. And, you know, one view says, talked about how, indigenous people were killed and like an end. It just, yeah, it's a quite amazing. So my first question is what prompted you to uh, look into this particular area in the first place? You know, uh, what's the link? Uh, what, what, what prompted you to, to, to look at this link between, you know, uh, anti-opium act and protection, pretending protection of indigenous and uh, anti-Chinese sentiment. Um, okay, I did not mute myself. Um, well, I think, well, first of all, the 1897 Act was, um, has been well examined in the field of Aboriginal studies. And it might relate it to my PhD, which focuses on the post-colonial narratives in, um, Australian children's literature. So um, that exposed me to indigenous histories and cultures. So I was aware of the 1897 Act and, and it, it has been regarded as one of the most draconian policies upon Aboriginal communities. Um, but then um, when I read these Chinese Australian newspapers, I do found it answered a lot of questions that we do not know before, like um, the Chinese perspectives on Aboriginal people and Aboriginal affairs. So, um, well, I think these newspapers shed a new light on how Chinese community um, responded and the agencies in particular responded to the anti-opium legislation and in particular how they um, engage with indigenous affairs to articulate um, the resistance to um, white dominance. Yeah, um, it's, um, it's a really interesting to see uh, how Chinese were, you know, uh, responding to that. And it's a really interesting topic, uh, research area that you embarked in. Um, I have a request. Uh, Neville asks, can you show the list of references again? Oh, yeah, sure. Mm. Sorry. I need to share my screen again. Sorry. Here it is. Hmm. Okay, so if we leave it there for a while and the while you you can answer the next question from Jocelyn. Uh, surely the concept of protection is based on the belief in uh, racial and cultural superiority. Does that still apply to the public perception of indigenous people? What do you think of the proposal of for voice in, in parliament? Uh, for Indigenous people currently? Well, um, thanks, Joycelyn, for your question. Um, I think you answered two, you asked two questions. Two questions. Yes. And I, um, sorry, better for me to... 
Now I can I stop share my screen? Yes. I yeah. Can't read the question. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks, Jocelyn, for a question. That's a really great one. Um, well, two actually were very great. Um, well, as you know, the protection is based on um, racial and cultural superiority. Um, the topic that I, um, the presentation is actually covered the Chinese perspectives a, a century, a hundred years ago. So I, 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 I cannot speak for the current uh, Chinese Australians. So I, I still don't know. I don't know whether um, that still represents the Chinese Australians perception of the settler governance and, and, and settler um, sovereignty over indigenous people. And um, as for what do I think of the proposal for a voice to parliament, I think it's really important. But I, um, but as I said, that there is still a lot that we do not know. Will China's Australian vote yes to the indigenous voice to, par to parliament? A referendum is coming to ask Australians to vote for a body enshrined in constitution that will enable Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders to provide advice to parliament. But it seems that we, might, we remain in the dark whether um, Chinese, Chinese Australians, um, how do they view the voice to parliament and more broadly the reconciliation? I believe this deserves and this warranted further study. And this is an urgent matter. Uh, while we uh, wait for more questions to come, I have actually two more questions. One is you touched on uh, in the Chinese newspapers and Chinese perspective, uh, particularly on hypocrisy of this protection and uh, how actually, and also expose that um, the aim of the protect, so-called protection is not to protect indigenous people, but really to uh, discriminate Chinese. Are there, uh, were there any uh, sayings or evidence that you could see in those newspapers that the resentment from Chinese perspective that the Aboriginal people were protected? You know, you exposed on one side. One side just says, you know, that uh, protection is a, is a hypocritical. The aim is really to um, oppose Chinese. But were there any sentiment to say, oh, you know, do you, uh, you protect Aboriginal people, but discriminate Chinese? So there is a resentment there among Chinese. Did you see that in the newspaper? Um, I'm afraid not. Mm -hmm. Because at that time, Aboriginal mm -hmm. people were um, severely discriminated mm -hmm. and the violence against them was, um, was horrified. Mm -hmm. And still by that time, frontier violence was still um, here and there, I believe. Mm -hmm. The other question I have is, um, did you encounter uh, any, because there were a lot of intermarriage or interrelationship in, between Aboriginal people and the Chinese people, what happened to those mixed families and mixed children? You mean in these newspapers? Yes. So, you know, while, while you were doing your research, did you encounter how they were treated? Uh, that's a very great question. Mm. Um, as we all know that um, Chinese men um, had developed close and intimate relations with indigenous women. But um, 
Well, their intimate relationship had been rarely discussed in the Chinese Australian newspapers. Mm -hmm. I think two things. One is given the prevalent, given the prevailing um, discrimination against interracial marriages, the intimate relationship between Chinese and Indigenous people were um, were not openly discussed even within the Chinese community. Mm. And the second thing is there is there was a discrepancy between the urbanized Chinese afar from Indigenous Australians and those in rural areas who had developed close contacts with Indigenous people. I have encountered one or two references commenting on the um, intimate relations between Indigenous women and Chinese men, but both accorded with the dominant colonial discourse that regarded these relations morally unacceptable. So, um, which also testified what I have just said that maybe within the um, Chinese community at that time, interracial marriages were not openly discussed. At least that's how I mm. how I found. Mm. Makes sense. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. It's really interesting. Uh, Zhang has requested that um, everyone is interested in your list of references. Would it be possible for you to email to us and we can email to Zhang? Yeah, sure. Okay, sure. all right. John, uh, we will email to you because you registered for this session. So we will be able to email the list once we get it from Dr. Xu. So not to worry. Uh, last question we take uh, is from Michael. Michael says, great talk, uh, Dodge, and great to see researchers such as yourself making use of these Chinese language sources. Uh, but all newspapers, as you know, uh, are a source that it needs to be carefully examined. I'm just curious if you can tell if the comments on the OPM cases in Queensland are coming from local, that is Queensland sources, or are these editorial comments from the Sydney-based editors of these newspapers? Great question, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, were the local people commenting or actually editors who based in Sydney? Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for this wonderful question. Um, well, I need to go back to the original source. But um, if I remember correctly, it comes from, well, the new source was from a letter um, that the editors received. So they, um, they posted the, particularly the Chinese testimony. Um, yeah, I, I, I think um, it is safe to be cautious about, um, about the accuracy of, of these cases. Unfortunately, I could not find um, the, I could not find this case reported in the English speaking, um, in the English language newspapers. So, um, but, to some extent, it does um, it does testify the one of the very rare but upbeat cursory line that I mentioned earlier um, that some Chinese were entrapped and wrongly uh, charged under the 1897 Act. Mm -hmm. But that was a great question because, um, as you know, that this newspaper. Um, had a lot of sources and a number of times they translated and compiled the articles from English language newspapers. And it That's is important so to verify the sources. Well, it's so true and they still do till today. <laughs> so yes, sometimes it is very hard to, to, to identify the sources and how much they change in, you know, in their translation or how much they get it from you know by themselves. That's very interesting. Uh, okay, one last question from John. Did the Chinese Australian papers carry commentary regarding the direct discrimination faced by everyday Chinese uh, Australians? Um, 
you know, from the from the 1840s onwards. So did the Chinese newspapers uh, show any commentary, you know, showing the commentary that uh, discrimination happened to Chinese? Regarding the direct discrimination faced by? Every day, you know, Chinese, so daily discrimination. I think that's against the Chinese. In my, in my mind, uh, well, in my mind, it's quite common that we're talking about the anti-Chinese sentiments that um, the Chinese faces. So mm -hmm. I do not, I'm, I'm sorry if I understood, I'm not sure if I understood your question. Um, yeah. the, que the question basically, you know, because you examined all those Chinese newspapers and in, in your examination, did you see any commentary that are actually talking about discriminations faced by Chinese? Well, I guess a lot of them, a lot of them were talking about how the injustice facing the Chinese, I mean, all these locate, all, all these court cases were testify the anti-Chinese sentiments. Um, but yeah, so, I think uh, nuanced mm -hmm. understanding is mm -hmm. nuanced reading is needed because mm -hmm. um, because from from reading this newspaper, take um, the um, the case that I mentioned, it is important to see that the Chinese editors and journalists um, did not did not argue on the basis of race. And they do not see that it is racial discrimination, partly because um, the concept of race did not introduce to China and the Chinese minds until the 1890s. So race, particularly racial categories, were still quite new to the Chinese. Mm. So instead, they make a great argument about the lacking of statecraft of the authorities. So you can see that these um, Chinese editors and commentators engage with indigenous issues and um, articulated perspectives on settler colonial governance. They want to make, um, they, they want to, um, from other articles, you can see that they um, even remonstrated with the authorities about statecraft, about um, political legitimacy, and and um, and benevolent governance as such, because statecraft um, for the then Chinese were they were very familiar with the traditional Chinese rubrics of statecraft, so um, they made um, they made argument along a different line. But from that, what I think is a more important point nowadays is that to see how um, the then Chinese migrants perceive themselves not as victims, not as marginalized persons, but as one Australians, um, and they want to um, taking part in the national making. So I, I believe this is important. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. I hope that, that answer your question, sorry. Well, I, I think it is a very interesting question, you know, like a, how uh, it's as a newspaper, but it's a Chinese newspaper, apparently English authorities or Australian English authorities may not, might not be able to read them. Without being them, read them, could they, dare they, or did they, you know, actually carry on? the comments that are, you know, protesting a uh, discrimination. So it's an interesting topic, and I think um, it's, it's just a com <laughs> I have to say this must be the last one. We have to end this. This is very interesting, a well-researched presentation, excellent work, classic, uh, classic British Australian strategy of trying to turn in different communities against each other. Do you know how other communities, such as Malay or Japanese people, fell into these relationship dynamics, you know, put against each other. Yeah, it's a good, good, good observation. Mm. Thank you very much for the question. I think you were asking 
um, whether Malays or Japanese people develop relationship with um, indigenous people. Yes, they do. And um, there has been a uh, um, there has been a rich body of literature focusing on indigenous and Asian interrelations, and in particular with um, Indonesians, Malays, certainly Japanese as well. Mm -hmm. Japanese people were excellent divers, so they made a, so made made presence in northern territory and formed close relations with Aboriginal people. Mm. Yes, talking about Japanese, obviously there were a lot of Japanese in uh, in Kimberley, but the question is, were they put against by policy, by, you know, Australian government policy, colonial government policy, were they put, those Japanese communities, were they put against Indigenous community, like Chinese were really set against Indigenous under the umbrella of protection? Mm. Oh, thank you. Mm. Um, well, I think, well, yes, yes. Um, when, um, I must say that the, um, the 1897 Act was precisely targeted against um, Aboriginals and, and Chinese, but other Asiatic races, Asiatic races um, at that time were also targeted as well, but not as stringent, or, or, or discriminatory um, as the Chinese. But um, say for instance, the um, Immigration Restriction Act 1901 um, actually excluded um, non-European, particularly Asian immigrants um, into Australia, prohibited their entry into Australia that actually also impacted the relationship between um, Japanese and Aboriginal people, as well as Malays and Aboriginal people. So, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's really not surprising. Yeah, it's really interesting. And um, we have to thank you again, Doji, for this really mind-opening and eye-opening research and the topic and your presentation is wonderful. And thanks to audience for the lively and robust discussion. So we will, um, we will have another session in this series before the end of the year. So looking forward to it. And now we will send out the invitation and information uh, later on. Thanks again, Daoji, and thanks everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you, Professor Han, and thanks everyone for coming. <laughs>